This is the third session talking about the Passover. But this time I want to talk about the Passover in the New Testament and essentially the Passover and the church. The reason is we have a very interesting text in a very interesting setting in the first letter to the Corinthians. And we must remember that Paul spent quite a bit of time in Corinth. Uh, he spent time in Corinth and uh, wrote two letters to the believers in Corinth. In these letters, there is a lot of interesting laws and things. And one of the things that is very interesting and it is ignored by 99.9% .9 of all Christians is a, a command about the Passover. But let me give you a little bit of background. We're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 starts with this horrible sin that existed in the congregation, in the community of believers in Corinth. There was a man that had a sexual relationship with his mother-in-law. My dear, one couldn't be any stupider and dumber than a person like this. However, he must have been a wealthy, powerful man because the church didn't do much about it. I'm sure if it was some John Doe, the, the believers would have done something about it immediately. But he must have been a man with, with means and power, and they kind of ignored it and didn't want to get into it and deal with it. So the Apostle Paul writes them a very strong reprimand, tells them what to do with this man, essentially to excommunicate him, to throw him out. And in this context, it must have been springtime or just before Passover. And uh, in verse 6 of chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he enters into the Passover theme. I said, don't you know that a little leaven, in Hebrew, chametz, leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. I'm going to stop here for a minute and analyze this text. He's using a Passover paradigm of cleaning the leaven from the house. Who does that? Only people who celebrate the Passover. If they don't celebrate the Passover, they know nothing about it, they are not going to clean every morsel, every crumb of leaven or leavened bread or cookies or, or burekas or or who, whatever you want that is made out of dough, that is leavened dough, has to be cleaned out of the house, from the cupboards, from under the cupboards, from everywhere. If you ate a sandwich while you're in bed, you have to change the sheets and wash them before the Passover. So there's no leaven in the house. So he says, listen, the principle is that a little leaven leavens the whole lump and makes the whole house leavened. Therefore, clean the leaven. Take out the old leaven. So you become a new lump. What kind of lump? A lump of truly unleavened bread. And he says, you are this unleavened bread. You are people without leaven, without sin. And therefore, you've got to keep the communities uh, with, without sin. You've got to keep the community pure from that leaven that is sin. And then he tells you why. For indeed the Messiah, the Christ, is our Passover. Do we as disciples of Yeshua have a Passover? Of course we have a Passover lamb. The Messiah is our Passover lamb. It's very interesting if I go back to Exodus 12, and, and read the beginning of, of the chapter, I find out a great, great mystery where it says every household should have a lamb and every household should slaughter that lamb in, at the doorpost and put the blood on the doorposts. And then it says, and 
all Israel slaughter the lamb, one lamb, the lamb, collectively. Of course, in the time of the Passover itself and, and centuries later, each household had their own lamb. But that text is a mystery text because it, it's impossible. But it is possible when we think about Yeshua as the Lamb of God. But back to this text in the New Testament. The Messiah is indeed our Passover who was sacrificed for us. Who is the Passover Lamb now? Jewish people haven't sacrificed uh, on the altar since 70 AD. We are now 2018, almost 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed, since we don't have any sacrificial services other than giving money like, like Christians do uh, to the church and charity. But we still have a Passover lamb that is alive, it was sacrificed for us, resurrected after the third day. It was not by accident crucified on the eve of Passover, folks. It was all pre-planned. It was all prophesied by the prophets of Israel. And so we have a Passover. It is the Christ, the Messiah himself. And then in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians, the, pro, the apostle says very clearly in an emphatic command, and in Greek it is very command language, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yesterday I talked to a rabbi, Orthodox rabbi here, neighbor, across the street from our building. And he was cleaning his car very meticulously from any crumb, everything. And we talked about, I'm going to wait uh, till next week because I you know, don't want to bring in bread when I go shopping to the supermarket, everything, back into the car. So I told him, yes, you're cleaning your car. I'm sure you're cleaning your house very meticulously. We need to clean our hearts as well from malice. And, and, and instead of malice and wickedness put in sincerity and truth, he said, yes, I agree. And our rabbis thought the same thing. I didn't tell him at that point yet that this is from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Yeah? But notice, the command is, let us therefore keep the feast. How can Christians read this and say the opposite? Let us not keep the feast. When I started keeping the Passover, I was fired in the States from the congregation that I was working with. Wasn't fired for long. The same day I was fired, the same day I was reinstated because I knew how to argue and, and teach the Word of God and tell them, listen, you're wrong. Because Christians think, oh, if you celebrate the Passover, you're doing it to be redeemed, to be saved, to have your sins forgiven. It has nothing to do with the sins forgiven. It has to do with a historical event that was the greatest event of redemption in history. And there were not only Jews there, there was a mixed multitude of a lot of Gentiles. We know some of the tribes that joined the, the Israelites, like the Canaanites and, and the Meherites and others, the Canaanites that joined with Israel and entered the land of Israel and had a part of the inheritance of the land together with Israel. So the Passover was not only for the Jews, for Israelites, for the 12 tribes. It was for all those sojourners, pilgrims that joined Israel and inherited with Israel the land and lived in the land. And the, the word of God in the five books of Moses and the Torah takes them into account and actually encourages them to join and to celebrate the Passover with Israel. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians. Christians are missing out because they are still tied by their umbilical cord to Rome and Rome worked hard 
to eradicate everything that is biblical and replace it with everything that is pagan. And so, yes, yes, my dear brothers and sisters, Paul commands the church in Corinth, which was made up of Jews and non-Jews, let us therefore keep the feast. Christian tradition says, let us not keep the feast. They replaced it with, the, with, with pagan holiday. Yes, resurrection was a very important day and a very important celebration. It happened in Passover. It didn't happen in, in Easter, named after some Babylonian goddess, Ishtar. Yeah, it happened in Passover. On the third day of Passover, Yeshua resurrected from the dead. The day of, of the harvest had started and Yeshua got out of the grave on his own. And he wasn't in panic. He had, took the time to fold his grave clothes and put them at the top of the marble slab where he was body was laid. We too don't need to be in panic, but we need to know that a part of the restoration of the church and the restoration of Israel is a return to the word of God, to the biblical pattern, and leaving behind all that false teaching that came from tradition of Rome. This is not Judaizing. Paul wrote it. Paul wrote it to Gentiles and Jews in the church in Corinth and he meant it. And we too, folks, need to start doing more of what the Bible says and coming home spiritually because the Messiah is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to ask you and me what he asked Peter before he was crucified. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? I say, yes, he will. You and me and thousands of others who are coming back home spiritually and the Jews who are coming back home physically and will come home spiritually as well. May you have a happy Passover and a kosher Passover. In Yeshua's name, amen.